My name is Jacob Sherman, and today is March 17th, 2010. Uh, I'm here in the Bennett Room of the OSU Library, visiting with uh, Mr. Conrad Evans. This interview is part of the O State Stories Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Uh, Mr. Evans, uh, thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure. So let us let us begin uh, discussing your background. Like, where did you grow up, and when you when were you born, and what that? I was born. Uh, in 1927, January 6th, wintertime, north, north central Oklahoma, 18 miles north and 10 west of Enid, Oklahoma, a small town called Nash, Oklahoma, out on a red dirt farm. Mm -hmm. Like uh, what? Like what kind of uh, crops and animals did the farm raise? Well, back at that time, uh, our crops were a little bit different than they are now. Uh, we were more of a diversified agriculture. We had uh, corn, uh, various types of uh, uh, sorghum crops, milo, hay crops, wheat, barley, oats, and uh, milk cows, beef cattle. Mm -hmm. Sheep, hogs, chickens. Now, did, uh, what were your chores on the farm? Well, tend all those crops, plant them, harvest them, uh, take care of the livestock, do the milking. Uh, that was basically it. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was year round. It wasn't particularly uh, uh, any lag time during the the year. Now, uh, was your land part of uh, the run or was it, did you farm, was your farm original homestead or? Uh, my grandfather uh, made the run, but where I grew up, uh, the land that uh, was land that he acquired during the run, mm -hmm. but uh, I was not, I did not grow up on a homestead. Okay. Now, did he share any stories of the run with you that you can recall? Oh, yeah. Like, what were they? Well, <clears throat> when they came in, of course, uh, they knew approximately where they were going and located uh, a certain type of terrain. He did not want flat land for some reason. He preferred rolling country. Mm -hmm. And where he uh, staked his homestead, uh, it was that. In fact, it was a little more, more rolling than <laughs> he really wanted, but he didn't hunt around and uh, he was in a little bit of a hurry to claim land because there were people that were claiming land. So that was the criteria. And then uh, he acquired other land as homesteaders moved to other places or chose not to do what was required to prove up on the crop land or on the land that they had claimed. Mm -hmm. So was he a sooner or no? No, no, he was not a sooner. He came in from uh, Kansas and <clears throat> he was not uh, too kindly to sooners, mm -hmm. in fact. Really? Yeah. He didn't like the idea that they'd come in and set up uh, and claimed, were able to claim the better land. Mm -hmm. Now was this land in the Cherokee Strip? Or? In the Cherokee Strip. Mm -hmm. So he made the big run, the one yes. where the famous photos are, the movie scene were. Yes. Now, uh, so your dad inherited that land? Yes. And mm -hmm. now is is that current land still within the family or no? 
Uh, it was until uh, about 10 months ago. We sold it. Were you, was your farm a Centennial farm then? Did it reach that designation? 100 years? Yes. Uh, not under my dad's ownership, mm -hmm. no. Okay. Um, you grew up during the Depression era. That's right. Do you remember, recall? Oh, yes. What can you recall about that? Well, time? I can I can recall how poor people were, and uh, they helped each other. My neighbor, I remember vividly, he did not have seed to plant his crops, and uh, my dad furnished him some seed at no cost. Uh, he borrowed. Uh, machinery for my dad to put the crop in and had a fairly good crop but of course it wasn't worth anything but my dad uh, he did have a truck and my dad had some fat steers that he wanted to take to Oklahoma City uh, he figured he could get more money out of them there and our neighbor insisted that he haul those steers to Oklahoma City. Well, as it turned out, he had several tire blowouts. My dad had to buy the tires <laughs> mm -hmm. and buy the meals, and which cut into the profit that he <laughs> might get on the steers. But I don't remember the exact price, but compared to today, it would be a giveaway. Mm -hmm. Any other stories from that era that you can recall? Well, I remember very clearly the Dust Bowl days too. Mm -hmm. uh, they and the Depression uh, came close together. And I remember coming home from school, I went to a country school, uh, which was a mile south of us, and there were no roads. They, there had been a road on the west side of our place, but it had been closed for many years, so you had to go across the fields and so forth. And uh, the dust uh, was so thick and the uh, vision was curtailed to the extent that I couldn't see far enough ahead of me to determine where the house was. I was coming across a wheat field, but uh, fortunately I I came to a grove of trees that I recognized and was it was close to the house and I did find the house. Uh, so that's what I remember mostly was the dust storms and how dry it was and hot also. At night in the summertime you could hear the chickens breathing in the chicken house which was quite a ways north of the house. But uh, it was intensely hot, no green vegetation. And uh, my dad thought uh, the chickens would uh, enjoy some green alfalfa hay, dried hay, mm -hmm. bale. And uh, he brought a bale to the chicken pen and put it out there and wet it down thinking that they'd choose to eat that greenery. What they chose to do was sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how hot it was. That's how hot it was. Yeah. Now what kind of precautions did you take during the dust storms? Did you cover your faces? Did you... No. Uh, we were far enough to the east of the dust bowl, the really intense dust bowl era, area that uh, we didn't do that, but we did hang uh, wet uh, cloths and so forth over windows to, and we took cloth and plugged every crack because uh, the houses back then did not have insulation in the walls or in the attic and that dust would sift in everywhere and uh, you could right on the floor quite often and the only way to get that up we didn't have electricity or running water or anything uh, was to sweep it and uh, 
with a broom corn broom and that fine dust was kind of hard to really sweep up. Now, do you remember Black Sunday at all? No, really I don't. Okay. Uh, I'm aware of it, but uh, as I said, we were far enough to the east of the dust out of the panhandle and so forth, but a lot of it came in, and we could see these dark clouds rolling in. And uh, the time that I'm speaking of, when I was coming home from school, it was dark enough the chickens went to roost. Mm -hmm. So that's all I remember. Now, I always ask this question to uh, former farm kids, uh, myself being one. What was your first tractor that you drove? Oh, well, the first tractor I drove mm -hmm. uh, was a Model L case. Now, the first tractor that I remember was a cross-motored case. My dad had one. And uh, he, he uh, ever, ever since I can remember, he had a tractor. Mm -hmm. And most of the farmers around we're still using horses, and we too. We didn't use that tractor for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we planted our row crops, we cultivated our row crops with horses, and did a lot of the plowing of small areas with horses, and we used the tractor only on the larger fields mm -hmm. to plow and to uh, disc and harrow and plant the uh, crops such as wheat and oats primarily. Now did you have any harvesters? Yes, okay. and we had a uh, combine and a binder and uh, certain crops like oats we always bound because the oat straw was uh, prized as a for bedding mm -hmm. and even eating. Mm -hmm. The cows would eat uh, oat straw. They didn't like wheat straw. How many uh, head of cows for the dairy operations? We'd uh, hand milk about 30 cows. Mm -hmm. Did you sell the milk or did you use it yes, for a private? We sold the milk and, uh, uh, well, I say we sold the milk, we separated it and sold cream. Mm -hmm and use the, the separated milk to feed calves and, and hogs. And we always had quite a number of, of hogs that we sold. And uh, calves, our dairy herd was not uh, dairy cattle per se. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the calves went into the feedlot. I say feedlot, uh, we fed them out as fat calves and sold them. Where would you sell them? Well, at Enid, which was 28 miles away, they had a sale barn. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, cattle dealers who came through the country buying cattle. And you could sell quite often right there on the farm. What about the cream from the milk? Uh, we took that to town, a local produce buyer in town. And uh, I remember as a kid watching them test it for butter fat mm -hmm. and uh, putting the, what they call the red reader in the top of the test tube to make a straight line. Is that the Babcock test? Uh, it could have been. Okay. I, I, I don't recall the name of the test. All right. Now, did, you, did your mother have a garden? Oh yes, uh, not my mother, my dad. Your dad? And all of us kids <laughs> participated in that garden. He was an excellent gardener and raised a lot of garden stuff. And we also had an orchard. And uh, <clears throat> my mother always canned over a thousand quarts oh. of fruits and vegetables. Oh wow. We had a large uh, cellar, concrete cellar, still there today. And uh, that was the storehouse. We cured meats, 
and uh, the canned goods and potatoes and onions all went in that cellar. So you did, so was this for family consumption or did you sell? Family, family consumption. Yes. So you really didn't have, quote unquote, a hard time during the depression? Oh, land, no. Well, we didn't have any money, hmm. per se. But, but you we weren't certainly, hungry. No, 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 we, we were not hungry, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> now, what, kind, what was you, like your favorite dish that your mother prepared? Well, she prepared wonderful biscuits and pancakes. She was just a good country cook and uh, homemade bread. Mm -hmm. no, nobody produced better homemade bread than my mother. Of course, you like what you grew up with. That's right. <laughs> and that's what you remember most is what you grew up with. But uh, she was a good cook and I know in the fall when we would uh, uh, butcher hogs and cure meat, there were certain parts of the of the hog that we did not cure and that would be tenderloin mm -hmm. and backbone and so uh, for breakfast following the day of butchering we would have heart liver tenderloin biscuits gravy <laughs> <laughs> so you were fed well oh. All of those high cholesterol, high calorie. <laughs> that wouldn't fit Michelle Obama's obesity program. <laughs> now, did you participate in 4-H at all? Uh, I guess it was about two years I did. And I had uh, some purebred sheep. And one of the men, uh, the one of the, a man that worked at the local bank, uh, sponsored me for that project. But that was my last two years in high school, and uh, that's all I participated. Did you ever come to Stillwater for the roundup? No, no. Show that, that was too far away. Okay. Did you show in the fair? Yes, I, sh I showed uh, Hereford uh, Bull in the fair one time, mm -hmm. Palm Creek, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Oh, uh, the best experience was getting to know the bull. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, we raised him right there on the farm, and he was from uh, some registered stock that we had, and. Uh, he placed second at the fair, mm -hmm. and that was the main thing, was preparing him, uh, showing him was not particularly spectacular. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you sell the bull at the fair? No. Okay. No, we kept him. Now, how often would you go to town? Well, uh, mainly on Saturdays. Saturdays? Yeah. Do shopping or? Yeah, do shopping and oftentimes stayed in town because uh, to stimulate uh, people coming to town, the local merchants would have programs and during the summer there was always an outdoor movie mm -hmm. that uh, you could attend and ordinarily they were of the western type. Custer's Last Stand, or The Last of the Mohicans, and things like that. Did you enjoy those uh, movies? Or? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Being a youngster that was very exciting because you got to meet other kids and uh, get into some kind of orneriness. And <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> now, where did you go to high school? Nash, Oklahoma. Nash, Oklahoma. How many were in your graduating class? Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that was because World War II took a I lot of I was going to ask about yeah. that, get into that. Yeah. Do you remember the start of the war? Do you remember? Oh, yes. 
where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, we didn't have a, a radio having no electricity uh, out on the farm. I uh, didn't have a radio, so I heard about it uh, the following day at school. And we listened to Roosevelt's, I guess you'd say, declaration of war. Oh, his day of infamy speech? Yes. What was, what was like the mood of that time period? Were you scared or apprehensive, nervous? No, really not. Uh, uh, the, the students there in the high school, uh, of course, uh, there was comment on how terrible it was and so forth. And uh, I'm sure there was some uh, derogatory remarks made about uh, the Japanese. But no, there was no real fear. How did the war like transform the rural farming community where you were? Well, I can't say that it transformed it at all. Uh, there were many things that took place uh, as they instituted the draft. There were certain farmers who were able to get deferments for mm -hmm. some of their sons, especially, at, I, don't, I forget what they called it, oh. but uh, they were needed. And uh, the draft board decided those issues. That's, a, that's the way my grandpa was, was he didn't get drafted because he ran the farm. Yeah. He was, because his father passed in 39, and so therefore he was still needed on the farm to run the operation. Same, same way in our community, and I, I'm assuming in every agricultural community, it, it was very much the same. And oddly enough, you would think there would be animosity that some got deferred and some didn't. There wasn't that. It was a, considered to be a, an honest need. Do you remember the rationing at all? Oh yes, yeah. I remember that. The shoes were rationed and my dad uh, had a big roll of uh, uh, tanned leather, and we all had, and I still have my grandfather's, and maybe it's my great grandfather's shoe last, and our shoes were resold. Uh, my dad was pretty good at putting a new sole on a pair of shoes. <laughs> And I took that uh, shoe last to Ethiopia with me, uh -huh. and I did a lot of shoe soling, re resoling there. Okay. Uh, quickly, before we get into the OSU Ethiopia portion, you want to, before we get into that, uh, can you discuss uh, your life at Phillips University, because Phillips University is no longer no. there at, up in Enid. So. That's true. So well, can, uh, one of the reasons I went there was it was close by. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister was, was going to school there also. She was older than me. And uh, of course it was a theology school but it was very highly rated in science and education. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't really know what uh, I wanted to do. So when I first went there, I went there two different times, uh, before the war and after the war. And uh, the first time was science, the second time was to be certified in education as a public school teacher. But it was an excellent school. Uh, small school, very friendly. 
Uh, I have very high regard for Philip Chandorsky. Mm -hmm. Did you serve in the war? Yes, I was in the Navy. You were in the Navy? Naval Air Corps. Do you want to discuss that? or? No, I was, uh, the way I uh, refer to my time in the service, I was a taxpayer's liability. <laughs> How so? Well, <laughs> I never saw any action in a war zone is uh, the reason. Uh, I, w I was going through the process of becoming a naval pilot and the war ended and uh, they gave me the option to go ahead in the Air Corps and uh, serve, uh, I believe it was four years after I received my commission and I uh, didn't I was not a military person mm -hmm. because I'd previously turned down an appointment to Annapolis. Oh, wow. And uh, <clears throat> so I chose to get out of the Air Corps, go into regular Navy, and be, be discharged on the point system. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take a long time. Uh, between my Naval Air Corps training in my discharge, I was still in the Naval Air Corps, uh, what they call the Naval Air Transport uh, System. And we would move planes from various and sundry places, but always in the American theater. And that included from Iceland back to the U.S., the Caribbean, and that's the area that I served in. Okay. But nothing spectacular, no. Okay. I was just curious about that. Uh, so you came back and you got your BS in education from Phillips, right? Mm -hmm. And you came to OSU or? No. Uh, no. I first went to Phillips and then I went into the Navy. I, uh, while I was in the Navy, I attended. Central College at Fayette, Missouri, and I attended Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute at Troy, New York. Mm -hmm. Which is a very good school. Yes, uh, it's an excellent school, excellent school. And uh, I got out of the Navy, I, w I came back, and I went to OU. Okay. I didn't stay there long because my farm background didn't uh, <laughs> conform to OU at that time. Uh, I have a high regard for OU, by the way. All right. And then I came back to Phillips, and then I came to, no, I came back to OSU. All right. And got my undergraduate degree. Oh, you finished your undergrad here? Yes. Okay. And then I went into farming. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> then I went back to Phillips to get an education certificate, okay. which I did. And I taught public school at Hennessy, Oklahoma, prior to going overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that last attendance, well, I, I need to fill in some gaps. All right, please do. Uh, I was farming and with my dad and my brother, and we were heavily in debt because we bought all machine, all new machinery, and we were farming about 2,000 acres. So I decided, and uh, we needed uh, some cash, so my brother and I, worked on construction, the Union Equity Elevators at Enid. Mm -hmm. We helped build those at night, a 12-hour shift, farmed in the daytime. Did you ever sleep? Uh, hardly, <laughs> hardly. And we increased the size of our livestock operation. We had a feedlot, and we'd leave work, feed the livestock. My dad did a lot of it but we'd haul silage from four miles away to feed 400 head of steers. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it was hectic. Mm -hmm. And during that construction, I met the lady that became my wife. And I went back to school. Uh, we. I don't. I don't know why I did that. Really, it was a kind of a hedge. If uh, the farming didn't turn out, uh, then I would be a like puppy. fall back on it. Yeah. And, uh, and then that phase ended and another phase took over. So what did you teach in Hennessy? I taught uh, science courses, agricultural courses, mathematics, and that was in the, at the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade level. Now, how did you become involved at OSU? after you got your degree. How did you actually land a position here? Well, that was, after I got my undergraduate degree, I went into agriculture. Then, when I came back to OSU, that's a, a story all on its own. While I was uh, teaching at Hennessy, uh, a faculty friend of mine, Hugh Rauch, uh, went on the Ethiopia program. I didn't necessarily know that he had, but a friend of mine called and said, uh, Hugh Rauch is going to be in town. Uh, why don't we uh, take him out to dinner? And uh, we did, we arranged for a group uh, of uh, former students of his uh, to have dinner at the student union. And uh, as a result of that dinner meeting, I asked him uh, how he happened to wind up in Ethiopia. Well, he said, are you interested in hearing the story? And I said, yes. He said, why don't you stay after the dinner's over and uh, we'll talk. So we did, and he asked me if I was interested. That was my entry back into OSU because uh, he came, he and another, Bill Abbott, came to my house and my wife and I uh, it had invited them to dinner, and they asked us if we wanted to go to Ethiopia. So that was my entry back into OSU. This was 1957 or 58? It was in 1956. 56? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. sorry. Just got my dates confused there. What was your wife's reaction when you told her, hey, I'm thinking about going to Ethiopia? She was uh, pre-warned, I guess you would say, uh, for reasons that I can't explain. We were engaged to be married, and uh, I was going to school at, at Phillips, and uh, we were sitting on the golf course one night, one evening, and uh, she said, uh, what are we going to do after we get married? And I said, oh, I don't know. How would you like to go to Ethiopia? Now that was out of the clear blue sky. <laughs> and she said, oh, my mother wouldn't allow that. And I said, I'm not marrying your mother. <laughs> but... Uh, I, I need to give you some background okay. on that, too. Uh, when uh, World War II was actually taking place, uh, the background for it was taking place in Europe, my dad was an avid follower of what was happening. And one of the things that really, really bothered him was the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. We subscribed to the Wichita Beacon. 
and they had some very vivid pictures of Ethiopian people armed only with spears throwing those at tanks and that bothered him that somebody was invading a country with that much of an imbalance, military imbalance. And he read also stories about the gassing of people, the poisoning of water, and that really upset him. And uh, that whetted my uh, desire to know more about that. And I read everything I could about that uh, Ethiopian invasion. So I was well grounded. I knew more about Ethiopian history at that time than I did Oklahoma history. <laughs> and I suppose as a kid, being uh, introduced to that is what caused me to say, how would you like to go to Ethiopia? because I had not met anybody from OSU. I was not even aware of the program uh, taking place, really. So, sort of predestination? I guess you'd call it that. Yeah, my dad's interest in Ethiopia and, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's where it happened. So when did you left in 1956, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Can you explain like the reaction like from some of your relatives? Well, some of them thought I was crazy. Most of them didn't even know where Ethiopia is. Uh, my parents uh, were very supportive of it. Uh, that meant that I was stepping out of the agricultural scene uh, with my dad and my brother. Uh, but my brothers and sisters were very, very much for it. It was... Uh, my parents had always... Uh, encouraged uh, their children to be adventurous and to think for themselves. And uh, I have raised my kids to be the same way. So yeah. although they hated to see us go, uh, they shed a few tears. Did you have children at that time? No. So that made it more e easier? That made it easier, yeah. You were in Ethiopia 1956 to 1968? That's true. And you were the longest serving person over there? Or? Of a continuous term. Hugh Rauk possibly uh, was there more time-wise. Really he wasn't because after the program was over, I uh, administered a World Bank program in Ethiopia for OSU and uh, spent a lot of time in Ethiopia. Were you aware of seeing us how we're sitting in the Dr. Henry G. Bennett room? Were you aware of the Dr. Bennett's vision and mission? of like the Four Point Program? In fact, yeah, that's another story in itself. I knew Henry G. Bennett quite well as an undergraduate here. And <laughs> I was laying on the lawn on the south side of Whitehurst Hall over here. And uh, somebody said, uh, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Uh, and I said, yes, it is. And I didn't turn around to see who was talking. And he said, uh, 
are you waiting for class? And I said, no, I'm waiting for a friend to get out of class. We're going fishing. And we were, and we were skipping a class to go fish. <laughs> and he said, you got an extra pole? <laughs> and I turned around then and it's Henry G. Bennett. Said, <laughs> and after that, every time I'd see him, he'd, he'd stop me and ask me if I'd been fishing lately. And uh, we struck up an acquaintance. I knew Henry G. I felt comfortable talking to him. And that that was my only acquaintance. It was just, you know, to stop. He, had, he was always interested in uh, what you were studying, how you liked school, and specifically how you liked Oklahoma A&M. Uh -huh. And he'd always ask you that. How do you like Oklahoma A&M? And if, you, if he suspected that there was something you didn't like, he would lead you to describe what you didn't like because he was very much a student-oriented person, as was his successor, Dr. Wilhelm. Mm -hmm. What kind of esteem did students have for Dr. Bennett? To the best of my knowledge, a very high esteem for him. Uh, very much so. He, he was very much liked by students because he was receptive to students. He would mix with students. He'd come down the hall of Whitehurst and there were a lot of classes held in the upper stories of the Whitehurst, and there a lot of ag courses. And <clears throat> he'd stop students and talk to them about uh, what class did you get out of uh, uh, how do you like it? Uh, are you learning anything? That was one of his things. Are you learning anything? <laughs> uh, students respected him very much. Mm -hmm. How did you hear about his death? Do you recall at all? Yeah, I recall. I think I read it in the newspaper, really. And you're right. I, I really don't remember, Jack, okay. how I heard about it, but I, I just remember hearing about it. Now, what, what, what do you think about Dr. Bennett's mission about foreign education, foreign higher education? How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, he was on the right path. Uh, I think uh, following our tenure in Ethiopia, I think we uh, withdrew from that vision a bit. And I think Henry G. would uh, have objected to our uh, reduced vision. In other words, we kind of withdrew inward. No, I, I think uh, Henry G. Uh, would have pushed for even greater participation in international because that was his vision, was that educational institutions needed to be involved if they were going to be a complete institution. They had to be involved in the world. Mm -hmm. So who arranged for you to go to Ethiopia and what kind of process was that like? Uh, Bill Abbott, who was, uh, I couldn't name the title of the office at that time, uh, was the one that uh, was in charge of, of the uh, personnel that went to Ethiopia you made all the arrangements through his office and that office later became the Office of International Programs but it had an evolutionary process through several different titles. 
Where were you signed to live and work in Ethiopia? At Jima, Ethiopia, where it all began, by the way. And it was a, an old Italian Catholic mission school that we rebuilt and used. Did you live there the entire time? No, I lived there eight years and then transferred to the um, what we call the College of Agriculture because it was it was a part of Haile Selassie One University and uh, it was the College of Agriculture of Haile Selassie One un University which was, was located in Addis Ababa the capital. What were your living conditions like? Well at Jima, as I said, we lived in uh, rebuilt houses built by originally by the Italian um, mission group that established that school. And uh, they were they were I have no criticism of them. They were different than what we have here. We have mostly wood construction. Those houses were full masonry. Uh, they had no wood except in the roof. And uh, you didn't hunt for a stud to drive a nail into to hang a picture on. But uh, they were, it was good housing. Were, were they heated? Uh, no. Uh, we had uh, electricity and you could get a, an electric uh, space heater, small, of course, and that was our only source. And uh, growing up on the farm where we had no electricity, that we used wood uh, heating stoves. I found a wood um, cook stove in uh, a storeroom there at the school and I put it in my kitchen and uh, I used wood to fuel it mm -hmm. and that was enough heat to supply the, the whole house. What was the weather like there? Oh, don't get me started. Uh oh. <laughs> no, it was the most wonderful climate. I've always said that the United States should make Ethiopia a state of the United States <laughs> just for a vacation spot. It's wonderful climate. During the daytime, uh, It'd get uh, maybe up to 80 degrees, a little over maybe, but not too often. And at night it'd drop down into the 40s. And <clears throat> early in the day you wanted a light jacket. Uh, it was wonderful. Was it the same climate year round? Yes. And uh, they, they called it summer and winter. But their differentiation was based on rainfall, mm -hmm. not so much on temperature. There was actually the dry season and the wet season. Mm -hmm. What were your responsibilities for your job? Like, what did you actually do there? <laughs> My contract stated not, not specifically per se, but I was hired to do what nobody else wanted to do or could do. It was that, it was, it, it encompassed 180 degrees. So everything from like grunt work to paper that's pushing right. or? That's right. And uh, I was uh, in charge of maintenance. That was buildings, roads, 
water supply, electrical supply, shipping, receiving, and classroom teaching. What work did you enjoy the most? All of it. All of it? All of it. Now, did you, who, who, who did you work with? Like, did you work for the entire university so you knew like everyone there or what? Yes. Yes. Uh, at uh, GEMA, yes, you, it was a very close relationship, uh, even with the students, because they were confined to the campus and were to leave the campus only with a faculty member. And uh, <clears throat> that was partly precipitated by the fact that when the school first opened and uh, the students were furnished clothing, they all wore the same type of clothing and they were identified as a privileged group by the local people. And if they went outside, there was some danger that they might be roughed up a bit so to prevent that, faculty members went with them. We went to the movies, uh, wherever they went, outside of the campus. Mm -hmm. But that soon wore off and uh, it was not a problem. But uh, still, uh, we, we uh, supervised their movements off campus. What parts of your assignment were the most difficult for you? Well, probably was uh, maintaining a water system because uh, we chose to develop a deep well system and our wells were five to six hundred feet deep and uh, maintaining the pumps uh, was a constant problem because we served quite a number of people, the dormitories and the, the staff houses with a potable water supply. Mm -hmm. Now, what did your wife do during this time? Did she work or? <laughs> she had four children. <laughs> that would do it. <laughs> I kept her busy. <laughs> uh, yes, she did work. Uh, secretarial work, library work, uh, things like that. Uh, we had uh, child raising was uh, not as difficult there as it is here, really, because we had very, very competent uh, local, um, what would you say, uh, Nannies? Yeah. Our caretakers? Yes, caretakers. We had uh, very good uh, home, uh, in the home uh, work, maid service, uh, gardeners, things like that. Were you guys treated as, I hate to say the word, elite or privileged or how did the local population view well, the Americans there. Uh, there may have been some of that, uh, Jacob, but we were encouraged and most of the people did it on their own, involved themselves with local people, local causes. Mm -hmm. Like uh, my wife, uh, when we first went there, she uh, worked with the governor's wife to produce clothing for an orphanage that the governor's wife was operating there in the town. And that way you got to be recognized as doing something for the local people also. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my work I also assisted with uh, extension work uh, like poultry to farmers outside, uh, farming methods. and things like that. 
the, the acceptance of uh, selected varieties of corn and grains and, and so forth. So when they realized that you were working with them and not they working for you, and we didn't, we didn't want to portray that at all, and didn't. Yes, we were, we were accepted. Mm -hmm. right, once again, we're back uh, with uh, Mr. Conrad Evans. We're, we're discussing the daily life of actually living in Ethiopia, what kind of tasks that he was assigned to do, um, what other cultural activities we're going to get into, and stuff like that. So. How did uh, your family, after you were gone a while, how did they, what, what were their thoughts of this adventure, as, they, as I would call it? What were their thoughts? Did they like you st still being over in Ethiopia, or what? Uh, we, uh, <coughs> we stayed uh, in Ethiopia two years at a time before coming on home leave and uh, we had uh, very generous uh, allotments of, of home leave. I don't know how they figured that at all but I never felt that we were deprived of time when we came on home leave and my parents uh, being knowledgeable of where we were, uh, my father especially was very interested uh, because of his deep concern uh, about a European power invading Ethiopia during World War II. That carried over to what we were doing over there and he was very interested in what was going on how we were trying to improve agriculture and agriculture education and so forth. So his interest and consequently also my mother's interest, uh, although they said that they missed us and uh, especially our children, uh, that was their grandkids, they were deprived of seeing them. But uh, as I said, they were uh, very supportive. They saw it as a necessary uh, need for the United States uh, to be involved in such things. And uh, consequently, we, d we felt um, very good about the attitude of our, uh, my family now. My wife's, uh, she was an only child, and her mother had some health problems that we were concerned with, and uh, her dad, being a former minister, was very encouraging in us participating in this type of work because he viewed it as missionary work, not necessarily theological, but uh, in that that uh, same vein of uh, concern for other people. Uh, her mother, uh, she didn't like for her daughter to be that far away, but they accepted it, or she accepted it, and that was it. How often would you come back to the States? Well, as I said, we came back every two years, but uh, finally we were over there so long that it seemed like uh, all we were doing was going on home leave. <laughs> and uh, we finally lengthened that to three years. And uh, that, of course, was at the end of the, the program over there when it I believe the last time we were on home leave was a three-year gap, and then we came home and the program extended them one more year. So two, three, and one. 
How long were your lengths of stay when you came back for home leave? That's what I was mentioning earlier. I don't know how they figured that, but uh, we were home, well, in the beginning, uh, the first home leave, something over 30 days. Oh, so good month, six weeks at a time? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Now, what time did you, year did you come back? Was it summertime or? Um, you could pretty well adjust that. Uh, we Ordinarily it was in the summertime because uh, that uh, coincided with the break mm -hmm. in school over there. How long was the trip back? How long did it take physically from leaving Ada Sadaba you mean uh, the fastest you could get here? Yes, or, uh, <laughs> the fastest. Well, let's see. You'd fly from Addis Ababa to somewhere in Europe. Most people uh, either Athens or Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, then uh, from there to um, London. So it didn't take about uh, three days. Did you did you happen to visit in Europe when you were making the trek back? Oh yes. Did you what did you see? Did you see Athens or Rome or all of it? So you played tourist up there. Yes, uh, and uh, well, everybody did. Mm -hmm. uh, we traveled uh, throughout uh, Western Europe. Not uh, so much Eastern Europe. We did uh, at one time plan a trip uh, to Russia, but that got canceled due to political. That was during the Cold War days. And uh, we traveled through the East also, through uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, Thailand, Philippines, Hong Kong, not mainland China, Japan. So you filled up your passport with stamps? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> How did you manage to keep in touch with your family when you were in Ethiopia? Uh, by mail entirely. Mm. There, there were no, well, there were telephones, but uh, where we were, uh, it was almost a futile process to try to call internationally. We, we could use telex. Okay. Were you... Now, because w I heard that the, that the mails were actually pretty good, the service was pretty good because it was connected with armed services mail? APO. Uh -huh. Yes. It was excellent. It was excellent. So you got a letter within a week or so, basically? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good then, because it allows you to keep it up, keep it in contact at oh, yeah. a decent basis. Uh, if you send it by regular mail, well, uh, a friend of ours. I don't know why she'd do this, but she'd send us a Christmas card every year. Mm -hmm. We'd get it in May. <laughs> <laughs> she was thinking it'd take that long to get it over. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> did you participate in American traditions? Like, did you celebrate Thanksgiving, Christmas? Oh, yes. And how was that? How was that celebrated? Did you have well, to make adjustments? Uh, no, not necessarily. It was, uh, as I said, uh, the American staff was a very close unit uh, because we had to provide our own entertainment if we had, like, holidays, so forth. But we did. We had Thanksgiving dinners group, all of us together. We had uh, Christmas uh, celebrations, uh, especially for the children. 
and even the students they they wanted to participate in in this also so we'd have a school wide christmas pageant or play and even though some of those students were not of the christian faith they they wanted to be there to see it so we'd have it in an assembly hall and it was part of the the social life of the school and uh, the same way with their holidays i was just getting to that oh okay well i was gonna i was gonna ask did you participate in their holidays and what kind of celebrations did they have did they all well you see uh, their their christmas celebration was not on the same day as ours so we participated in theirs and uh the Christianity part dominated, although we had students who were of the Islam faith. Uh, I think we probably did them a disservice by not uh, incorporating their holidays mm -hmm. into our, our life there at the schools. Because aren't they aren't Ethiopians one of the oldest Christian? Oh yes, they are subgroups. I, I yes, as, as a as a national religion, I think they are the first uh -huh. to accept Christianity as a national religion. Of course, that was uh, by decree of an emperor, uh -huh. and uh, most people don't realize that. But the Coptic Christian is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, of the organized mm -hmm. Christian religions. How long did it take for you to feel culturally acclimated to Ethiopia? Did you have... Well, <laughs> culturally acclimated. How long, like, like, to rephrase that question, how long did it take for for you to feel that Ethiopia was your home? It didn't take me very long. Uh, and consequently, it didn't take my wife very long, but it was more difficult for her than it was for me because I had job responsibility to take my mind off of other things. At first, she was at the home, working with uh, servants, uh, maid uh, that we hired to do the house cleaning, uh, gardener, and that left her with nothing to do. And uh, <clears throat> she needed something to occupy her time. So uh, she was very creative, and she became... Uh, an excellent gardener of uh, flowers, uh, edibles, and so forth, and she devoted a lot of her time to that. And uh, then later became uh, secretary for the administration, worked in the library and things like that. And of course, as I said, she bore four sons while we were over there. Was the birth at home? Uh, one of them was. Mm -hmm. The other three were in the uh, hospital in the capital city. Oh. What was the, in your opinion, what was the thing that was the most culturally shocking to Americans that went over? Well, I think the the thing that was most shocking to them was uh, the poverty. The uh, disparity in what we came from to what we were working in. Uh, that, that was a shock. Could you describe this poverty? Yes, to see children uh, uh, with uh, either no clothing or just uh, a shirt, uh, no shoes, 
uh, in that part of Ethiopia, they were not necessarily malnourished. Uh, the type of housing they had, uh, although as you were there longer, you began to realize that they didn't need what we had. We had too much. And uh, that was a shock in reverse, in a way, to realize. And I, I felt a little bit guilty about uh, our American consumption uh, weighed against what their level of consumption was. And I think I developed that because I was there longer and lived in it and developed an appreciation for it. And maybe not an appreciation, Jacob, a concern. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, getting into the food aspect, how did the, how did you adjust to Ethiopian food? I love it. You love it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> My wife, by the way, is a noted Ethiopian cook. Oh. <clears throat> she has even uh, taught the food services here at OSU how to make Ethiopian foods. Mm -hmm. What do you like about it? Just I like the taste of it. Uh, I like everything about it. <clears throat> so how often does she s still pr uh, prepare Ethiopian food for you? Oh, probably once a month mm -hmm. uh, to to prepare genuine Ethiopian food uh, requires a bit more work than our go to the grocery store and buy prepared stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you ever uh, get down to the city to the Ethiopian restaurant? Oh yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Have you been there? No. Just thinking about it makes me hungry. So, <laughs> do you like uh, Ethiopian food? I never had it. So oh. I've had Indian. Oh, if you like Indian, yeah, the new Indian yep. restaurant out here. Uh, I like. I've been that. there. So that's and the Thai good. restaurant down. Yep. But uh, really, one thing that for me is like I really haven't gotten into like the Mediterranean stuff. Yes, I've had Greek, but met it like. Turkish food it's real flavorful mm -hmm. the Mid <laughs> Middle Eastern food is real flavorful and Ethiopian food I just have not gotten into that yeah. yet I want to so believe me I want to try yeah, did certainly you, do so besides the food did you bring back any other Ethiopian customs no not that I could uh, could cite no did you, like, did you bring back any artwork or statues or any of that type of thing? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, our Wood home carvings. is kind of a, an Ethiopian <laughs> Ethiopia <decor>. West. <laughs> what? Ethiopia West. Yes. <laughs> How did you uh, document your stay in Ethiopia? Did you take pictures, diaries? Did you have a handheld camera? Oh yes, I had a camera and uh, my son is presently <clears throat> putting all of our, our slides and photos on uh, CDs. Mm. Yes, I have hundreds if not thousands of photos. Did you get to travel around the country? Oh yes. Like, did can't think of the geography. Was there mountains type? Oh yes, uh, it, very mountainous. Very, very mountainous. mountainous. And uh, very few roads. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, uh, first I took uh, an American made car over 
but it didn't take long to change my mode of transportation to four-wheel drive and get off the road. So uh, I had first a small Jeep and then I had a seven-passenger Land Rover. I graduated to a ten-passenger Land Rover and I went all over the country. Did you like driving the Land Rover? Oh yes. Was that yeah. one of your favorite vehicles? It's one of the it's one of the best vehicles ever made. <laughs> now, were, in Ethiopia, did you ever see any remnants of the Italian invasion? Oh, I, absolutely. You'd see uh, old tanks, and uh, the main thing that you saw was road building equipment, big rollers, steam engine type. Uh, rollers for crushing and packing the rock mm -hmm. and they built wonderful roads uh, in the old Roman manner mm -hmm. and they would hand lay oh, wow. a rock base and then finer and, and they're still there. <clears throat> See I, I that was one of the things that I talked to uh, Dr. Webb and he said that was one of the things that he would remember was the roads that the Italians left. Yes, absolutely. Did you see any exotic animals? Oh, yes. Like what kind of animals did you well, see? All or, of them. All of them? <laughs> um, the major ones, uh, the buffalo, uh, both the Cape Buffalo and the Nile. Mm -hmm and uh, lions, leopards, elephants. The, the, you could just uh, run down the list. And all of the gazelle types from the wildebeest, hartebeest, uh, Thompson's gazelle, the uh, water buck, uh, the greater and lesser kudu, baboons, Warthogs, oh. forest dogs. You basically see what the uh, Oklahoma City Zoo has. <laughs> well, I've seen more than they have. Yeah. <laughs> as far as that that uh, area of game is concerned. Ever do any big game hunting when you were there? Well, yes, I, I shot some uh, game, but uh, I shot one oryx for a trophy. Uh, I shot a buffalo. I shot a lion, one lion. I shot two leopards. I shot a giant forest hog, which is in the museum here. But I, I didn't uh, just go out and, and I abhorred anybody that did. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, happen to travel within the rest of the African continent at that time? Yes, I, I drove also over uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, those three especially. Uh, I was in the Sudan, up and down the Nile River, <coughs> in Egypt. But uh, that was about the extent of it right there. Did they have, were the border checkpoints or? I was just thinking you have so much open country that they didn't really have border well, <laughs> checkpoints. You could cross the border if you were an adventurous type and, and had a four-wheel drive vehicle and had some knowledge about choosing the terrain and so forth and uh, yes I crossed the border. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anyway. Oh we're on the well, road. Well <laughs> I, I got caught one time. Uh, I was uh, in the Ogaden area of Ethiopia that's in the Somali section mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was following a range of hills and I knew that if I went that way and made a right-hand turn, 
and I would uh, intersect with the road from uh, Hargesha to Jigjiga. But I went a little bit farther than that. I realized and the border made a, a turn inward there and I crossed into Somaliland. Mm -hmm. And when I turned right and intersected the road and made another right turn to come into Jigjiga, I was actually approaching the checkpoint out of so Somaliland. <laughs> and they stopped me. Well, <laughs> across this dry <laughs> gulch called Tugwajali. Over on the other side was the Ethiopian checkpoint. Well, they were over there motioning and saying, come on, come on. And I realized that I was in the wrong area. And when they, they blocked the road first, and as I eased up there, they parted. I just shifted gears and down that dry gulch I went to the Ethiopian side and then it took me four hours to explain to them what I had been doing oh, over there. <laughs> but I got through. You made it safely. Yeah. Did you ever have any contact with uh, the Emperor Haile Selassie? Oh yes, I met personally with Haile Selassie and talked to him. Uh, but not uh, it was on an informal basis, but uh, you didn't do that often, no. What was he like when you met with him? Like, can you re re describe describe him for us? He was a very gracious person. Uh, in uh, formal occasions, he always spoke through an interpreter. He didn't speak English, although he spoke English. But his his. Uh, major foreign language was French and uh, he oftentimes would uh, use French uh, to go to an interpreter to speak back to you in English but uh, <clears throat> in a, on a, an informal basis he would speak English and was a very easy person to be around in that occasion Yes, I, I had a lot of respect for, I have a lot of respect for Emperor Haile Selassie. Were you ever invited to any of his palaces? Mm -hmm. What were they like? Oh, they were very, very elegant. <laughs> Compared to the local peasant, there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. How did uh, Ethiopians at that time uh, view him? It depended on where you were. Uh, if you were in the uh, northwest uh, area, uh, Wolo, Tigri, uh, Begemder provinces, uh, which was the Amhara, and that's uh, where he was an Amhara. Uh, they were 100% behind him. If you got into the northern Tigray area, they were actually contenders historically for the throne. And then you had the major population group, the Oromos, uh, who felt that uh, they had been colonized by an Amhara, King Menelik, and they were grudgingly supportive. Did you see any undercurrent political movements? Oh yes, there were some attempted coups while I was there. And uh, he was always able to subdue those so there was a, an undercurrent always, always. And when I first uh, uh, went to <coughs> Ethiopia, the, the major road between uh, Asmara and uh, Addis Ababa uh, was closed. 
due to, uh, we called them shifters, bandits, but it actually was a political movement of insurgents, uh, I guess you would say. <coughs> and another guy and I drove uh, two old buses that uh, we were given by the American uh, military base in Asmara, and we drove those back. And uh, when, for a certain portion of the way, we had to take uh, armed troops with us. Yes, it was quite an experience. That was driving it through that very mountainous territory to around curves that you had to stop and back up to negotiate the curve. Those long buses wouldn't make the curve. Yeah. Did you see any like Marxist movements or was that underground? No, uh, I was totally unaware of any Marxist movements at that time. That happened shortly after we had terminated the program. Okay. Were you what what like what was the overall American involvement there? You said there was a, a military base, and what else? What kind of support did the United States give Ethiopia at that time? Well, uh, in Asmara was uh, the major communications base for any American personnel, like the president, if he traveled outside the United States. That was the center communications at Asmara, and it was the major listening post for, to the Soviet Union. Uh, so it was a, a very important base and a very well supported, although it was not particularly an armed base. Now, the United States supported the military of Haile Selassie's government and there was oftentimes training groups in the country and uh, <coughs> we met many of those but we didn't think anything about it, uh, it, it being the thing to do how how did you hear about news from back home? Primarily by radio, shortwave. Is that how you heard about the Kennedy assassination? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What on, was on the radio? Was that what was that atmosphere like when that occurred? Well, uh, <laughs> strange to say, but it affected the Ethiopians uh, as much or more than it did uh, the Americans because they had a different perception of what would happen than we did. We knew that there would be an orderly transfer of power. They suspicioned that it was an overthrow of government. And uh, being allied to the United States the way they were, uh, they had more to fear uh, if that was the case than we did. So yes, they were very aware of it uh, and uh, they were very grieved by it also that they held their own uh, ceremonies uh, and for him. I think the emperor actually I'm pretty sure the emperor was actually in the funeral procession. Oh, he was marching right beside Charles de Gaulle. Yeah, that's right. I yeah. remember the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, did did the campus actually come locked down then because of this no. uncertainty? No, 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 no. Power or no? Okay. No. Now, going to 1968, can you tell us? what the circumstances were that led to the withdrawal of Oklahoma State? 
support? Well, this was always, uh, we were working our way out of a job. That was the concept uh, from the beginning. <clears throat> However, the OSU administration didn't agree fully with the uh, United States uh, Agency for International Development, who was the federal, which was the federal unit in charge, really. USAID said it was time to turn it over to Ethiopians. We didn't see it that way. Uh, for more than one reason, there was not enough trained personnel to take over the administration and operation of the academic units. Because many of our graduates, when they returned, were given administrative positions in the central government, not back to the academic institution. So uh, we had some concerns there, and uh, but uh, the federal concerns prevailed, and we closed it out. So, so it was it was so the federal government provided the funding. The U.S. provided the funding instead of the institution. Uh, it was a joint effort. <clears throat> The U.S. government provided some funds, and the Ethiopian government mm -hmm. provided some funds. What What was the reaction of those who were in Ethiopia of this news at that time? Were they stunned, saddened, or? Are you mean about uh, Kennedy? No, no, no. About the closure of. Uh, well, uh, the Ethiopians did not want it uh, terminated. Not at all. Uh, we uh, we knew uh, who was in charge. The U.S. government was basically in charge. Uh, we didn't agree with them, but we accepted it. What was uh, your like son's reaction to this? To the closing? Yeah, but oh, we're gonna have to go move back to the states. No, no. Uh, of course, the two oldest ones <coughs> had, uh, excuse me, <coughs> had uh, formed very deep friendships with uh, local children. So much so that those children uh, asked uh, for transportation to the airport, which uh, was 45 kilometers away. Uh, to see them off. And I get a, a bit emotional. Because it bothered me too. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to leave. I left a lot of things that I intended to do not for myself, but projects for the school and the Ethiopians that I worked with because I enjoyed working with mm -hmm. them, Jake. Otherwise you wouldn't have spent all those years there. But I realized that we couldn't stay forever. I was asked to stay on by the Ethiopian government, but I felt that I had some obligation to my children if they were going to be U.S. citizens rather than, I call them, world citizens. We needed to get them back here and get them into the system. And I don't know whether that was the right thing to have done or not. Uh, but we did it that way, and it's hard to second guess yourself. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't look forward to leaving. No. 
I understand. <laughs> you still got that soft spot in your heart for her. Oh yeah. I have a multitude of very close Ethiopian friends that were formed through OSU after the program was over. Mm -hmm. That leads me to my next question. So you have maintained relationships with those that you met from your time in Ethiopia? Oh yes, definitely. Definitely, I, I get now email from them almost daily if not weekly at least. What about did you have you assisted with those international students that have come from Ethiopia since you got back here? Assisted in what manner? Like just that you're you're a person to go to and talk to about them oh, yes. culturally and definitely. Did you ever learn their language? Yes. Are you fluent? Or? No. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> I uh, speak what I call a truck driver type <laughs> language. <laughs> I can uh, make myself uh, understood and I can basically understand what they are trying to say. Is there a bond with faculty members that you work with in Ethiopia? Is there what? A bond with those that oh, you yeah. work with? Yeah. What's that like? Well, it's hard to explain. Uh, let me explain it this way. Uh, I came back uh, on home leave and one of my farmer friends, an old farmer in my area, he said, uh, are you teaching those savages anything? And I said, yes, Mel, I'm telling them all about people like you and uh, what you believe and how you perceive them. <laughs> he didn't like that too much. And he said, well, can you trust those people? And I said, let's put it this way. If my life was in danger, I would want them to be within hearing distance because they would come. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I feel. I completely forgot to ask. What did you teach over there? I completely forgot to <laughs> ask you that. What a basic question. <laughs> well, I taught uh, mathematics at the college level because the college of agriculture was there at that time. I taught uh, mathematics at the undergraduate level. I taught world history. I taught economic geography. I taught uh, horticulture. I taught uh, a soils course one time, but that was what I was supposed to do. If they didn't have right. a teacher lined up, I you filled in the gap. I filled in the gap, and oftentimes with very little notice. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And you probably also learned by jumping in. Oh yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How has this, how did the Ethiopian experience impact your life? Well, it, it became my life, basically. It, uh, it turned my life to internationalism, yeah, I guess you would say. So you would, oh, had sorry. I remained in agriculture, I would have been somewhat uh, confined, I guess you would say, to the local community, state, and nation. Uh, and my international experience would have been mostly through hearing and reading. So you're more in tune, attuned to the needs of the world, I hate to say it like that, but you're, you're aware of you're more aware of international problems and what kind of definitely 
definitely, and it disturbs me that our population as a whole are not informed on an international basis as they should be. Well, we'll probably discuss that kind of philosophy okay. once we get into your work with the Office of International Programs. All right. What do you think the legacy of the OSU Ethiopia project was or is currently? The legacy, define legacy for me in a term. What, how do you think, looking at back at the, like looking at the back at like the University of Land Grant Mission and whatnot, the educational goals of Dr. Bennett, did, did the project fulfill Bennett's vision um, or even, even like the, the John F. Kennedy's vision of the new frontier and the whatnot that we're going to work for democracy, that type of thing. Yes. Big, big macro giant picture. The, the legacy was this. <clears throat> Ethiopia suffered uh, political upheaval after our program ended. And we discussed that as Americans, uh, what would happen with the death of the autocratic type of government Haile Selassie operated when he departed. And uh, we hoped that there was enough of a civil service uh, cadre in place to absorb the transition to a more democratic type of government. Uh, that wasn't the case. <clears throat> and they underwent uh, uh, a period of dictatorship, which they're still experiencing. But throughout all of this, Jacob, it was the OSU program that trained a large enough group of people that they were the glue that held that country together. They performed the tasks that were needed to be performed to keep those institutions there and operating. And today, where we left uh, a group of about 200 students, it's now 20,000. And uh, there are other, both institutions being the same way. And we have, there's evidence, as was exhibited just recently, the World Food Prize was given to an Ethiopian who went through those institutions that we left there. And uh, although we weren't there, and uh, he has a very high regard for the program and spoke here, did you attend? Mm -hmm. But I, I know. And he gives OSU the credit for him being what he is because we left those institutions there with people who would operate them. And uh, there are other legacies also. Uh, one of the most uh, debilitating diseases of livestock is rinderpest throughout Africa and Asia. And <clears throat> an Ethiopian who went through those institutions produced a vaccine mm -hmm. for that disease, which she donated to the world mm -hmm. for five cents mm -hmm. and uh, it's in operation worldwide now and uh, is contributing to the income of world agriculture <clears throat> uh, a figure that would be astronomical. Mm -hmm. 
you returned in, uh, to Ethiopia in 2005, correct? Returned to there? Yes. Yes, I was, no, 2004. Oh, 2004? Yes. Uh, that was my typo. On that the was their 50-year anniversary. How, what led you to, were you invited back, or how did that come about? Yes, we, we were invited back. Uh, they invited uh, a representative from OSU. And uh, none of our top administration uh, was able to go. So people who served on that project uh, went, as well as a former Peace Corps administrator, uh, who <clears throat> at that time was faculty at OSU. <clears throat> What were your thoughts when you returned to the Ethiopia? What were my thoughts? Yeah. Well, my thoughts, uh, I anticipated seeing a lot of change, but there had been even more than I could anticipate in the growth of the institutions. Uh, one of the most striking uh, things was the increase in population which was tremendously evident. But the other changes, uh, buildings, roads, things like that. So, so did the country progress in those 40 years that you... Uh, yes, they progressed, but there's still a a lot of abject poverty in the country. Did you any uh, see any effects of the Ethiopia war with Eritrea at all or no? Oh yes, because I uh, visited both uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia and one of my <coughs> former student's brother took me through the uh, Ethiopian armaments that they had taken over mm -hmm. tanks, trucks, and so forth that had been put in a graveyard, more or less. And he took me around and showed me the trench work in the mountainsides where they had torn up a railroad to use the rails to construct protection from bombs and shelling. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of it from both sides. Uh -huh. Woods, I've heard that even to, even now for some Eritreans, hard to, when they, going through the Ethiopian project because Eritrea was part of Ethiopia at that time. Mm -hmm. They fought for their independence. Mm -hmm. It's still hard to go back and associate with Ethiopians. Did did you see that as the case? Oh yes. Did you definitely personally know any Eritreans that felt this way? Oh yes. In fact, uh, I participated in uh, work with Eritrea after they had gained their independence. Uh, I went back to uh, participate in a, um, I don't know what you would call it, it was a conference on the improvement of Asmara University and uh, I sat uh, beside Isaiah Safawarki at a banquet and visited with him and at that time, there was supposedly general friendship with Ethiopia, uh, at least at the top administration level. But I detected at that time deep, deep animosities between a lot of the academic unit, uh, faculty and staff, and uh, they, there was a deep schism between Eritrea and Ethiopia. 
overall, how in this uh, 2004 return trip, how were you treated? What was your overall reception back there? I get him. I get him more. I was received equal to family. I can't explain it. It's as deep a relationship as brother to brother. That would be the best way I could. Mm -hmm. I feel fully a part of Ethiopia. Uh, I've never felt endangered uh, from Ethiopians at all. I have no hesitation whatsoever to go to Ethiopia. It, it's just Hard to explain. Mm -hmm. Does your, does your, does the rest of your immediate family share this? They've not been back in, and had the opportunity to develop the relationship that I have, mm -hmm. because after the OSU project was over, I administered a World Bank project with OSU. And I went back many, many times mm -hmm. and kept those contacts alive. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> and it was unfortunate. I was the one keeping the contacts alive, not OSU, mm -hmm. because they didn't participate in it. And I, I feel bad about that. All of the faculty that uh, was on the World Bank project were off campus. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the OSU feeling. And uh, OSU is a family word in Ethiopia. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe the administrative personnel here realize the... Full impact? Yeah. They, they just don't grasp it. Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything else about your Ethiopian experiences that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to share? Mm. No. Okay. I'm sure there are, but uh, uh, all I have to say it was a great experience. It continues to be so in my contacts, although I don't travel there anymore. <clears throat> I have a tremendous correspondence contact, telephone contact with Ethiopians. As I said, it became a major portion of my life. All right, we're back with uh, Mr. Conrad Evans. Uh, Working on our third hour of the interview. <laughs> Congratulations, made this far. So now we're gonna get into his work with uh, Office of International Programs, which I now believe is called the School of International Studies. Is that correct? That's uh, as nearly as I can determine. That they fill the role. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you came back in 1968. Was there a job lined up for you at OSU, or how did you become involved with the Office of International Programs? Can you fill when that came, gap for When us? I came back in 1968, I came back uh, as a graduate student in agronomy. And uh, I was on a, an assistantship, and uh, I don't know. Let's see, I guess it was in 1973, I was offered a job with the uh, Denison Peanut Company, which I took. Okay. 
and uh, I was there five years, and uh, it was at the, that time that I was offered a job with the Office of International Programs, and I came back to OSU in 1978. What was your responsibilities for that job? The, uh, off, in the Office of International Programs? It was varied, but the major, uh, my major responsibility was with international students and sponsors of those students. Uh, now, when I say sponsors, I mean uh, within their countries or at least without, uh, outside the United States. And uh, I would contract in the name of OSU for their specific educational needs. And uh, these sponsors would pay for the terms of that contract. So you would be involved of, say, a university in Pakistan didn't offer a program in, for example, biochemistry, mm -hmm. they would contact uh, you to set up that w work for a particular student? Or is yes. That, is, that, yes. is that my understanding? That's is that it, correct? That's exactly right. Because the Office of International Programs was the entity that did the contracting for the services of Oklahoma State University. We were a central office. Did you assist uh, foreign exchange students then, or yes. foreign students? Yes. What kind of assistance did uh, the office provide? The foreign exchange? Yes. Our foreign students, international students, what kind of assistance did the office provide at that time? Well, uh, we were, <laughs> as I said, we would contract and we would provide services for a fee to those students. If they needed to go to the hospital, we saw to it that they got to the hospital. Uh, if they needed, uh, we saw to it that they had supplies, we saw to it that they had adequate housing. Um, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. We took care of their needs. Mm -hmm. Now, outside of the academics, we saw to it that they had uh, adequate uh, uh, contacts in the academic field, but we didn't dictate the teaching or anything mm -hmm. like that. We provided the support services, even to the handling of their monies from their sponsor and reporting their academic progress and any required reporting to their sponsor, whether it be private or governmental or otherwise. So would you say it would be like a mini consulate? That would be a good comparison, yes. A mini council, because we handled also their their uh, what do I want to say the immigration process for them mm -hmm. the student visas the student visas yes mm -hmm. did you have a role with uh, working with the student visas then or was that yes okay. Now, what was your title? Because I, from the book on the Office of International Programs by uh, Jerry Gill, you were called the Associate Director. Now, was that the accurate title of your position? Or? Yes. Okay. I'm just clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Now, you had, you had worked with uh, Bob Abbott. In Bill Ethiopia. Abbott. Bill Abbott. Sorry, my, my, yeah. I apologize. Bill Abbott in Ethiopia, was he the one that recommended you for this position or? Uh, he was the one that uh, hired me, mm -hmm. yeah. 
and what could you describe for us like the working relationship and your overall relationship with uh, Bill Abbott? Well, uh, he hired me and uh, the job description he was partly responsible for. That job description was uh, determined by the administration of the program in Ethiopia and to the extent that he was their agent in choosing a person to fulfill that job description. That is how I came into the program. I filled the need for the type of person that they had determined ahead of time that they needed. Now, what years did you work for the Office of International Programs? 1978 through 93, or through 92. 92 was the year retired? I retired January 3rd, 93. Oh, so, close so, enough. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> where, where were your offices located? Well, first, uh, we were located in the USDA building above the police department. Mm. And uh, then in the Watkins, the West Watkins Center. West Watkins Center. Mm -hmm. What uh, you came back to OSU, back to OSU in 1978, like, and you were here in the in the 50s. What kind of changes did you see between those two times? Well, mainly it was. Uh, the first thing that I, I would notice was uh, the expansion of the campus, uh, the physical plant. Mm -hmm. And of course along with that came a, an increase in the number of students. But uh, basically that, would, that was about it. Do you, could you describe for us the history of the Office of international programs prior to your arrival? Well, as I said, it, uh, there was considerable evolution in <laughs> the final title of Office of International Programs. I really don't know much about the history from let's say 1950 is uh, a fair date for the beginning of the Office of International Programs and its termination in, what, 19, when, when did it cease to exist? I retired in 93 and it continued to exist for a while thereafter. So, I, I really don't know coherently the procedure that it went through. Okay. What kind of, because I heard that uh, President Wilhelm was influential on the office? Do you know what kind of influence that he had? On the Office of International mm -hmm. Programs? Very definitely he did. Uh, he was essentially, you would say, a part of it because we, we answered directly to the uh, president of OSU. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not through any other office. So he was very influential in that respect because we reported directly to him and he directly back to us. Like, did he shape like the mission and vision of yes, the Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh, because he, like Henry G. Bennett, was very 
uh, internationally minded and uh, supported uh, uh, programs of OSU internationally and consequently the Office of International Program being the entity responsible for contracting for the services of OSU. Uh, we had a very close relationship with him. Like, could you flesh out more like his vision of how or how internationally he viewed the world? Like, could you describe that more? Uh, yes, uh, in that uh, he wanted to see campus-wide, campus-wide, every college being involved in international projects, even to the extent of student exchanges, faculty exchanges of this nature, even down to the single student and groups of students. Uh, he also was a strong supporter of contractual agreements for educational objectives in foreign countries. He had a, a broad vision of the international education. Do you know where he got that this prospectus? Probably from Henry G. Dillon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, not entirely, no. Uh, he was his own person mm -hmm. in, in every aspect. Uh, he came to OSU, no doubt, with that concept. Where, where he developed it, I would say, it was at a young age, probably in his advanced degree work somewhere. Did you ever meet him? Oh, yes. Did you meet him actually in Ethiopia? or No, I met Oliver Wilhelm right here. <laughs> when was that? When was your, when did you first meet him? Hmm. Well, I can't <laughs> name a time, but I can name an incident. Okay, please share with <laughs> us the incident. Well, I'm not going to share all of the okay. incidents. Okay. <laughs> because uh, I have one concept of it and others have another. But um, there used to be a, oh, what would you call it, a tradition between Aggies and engineers. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not. I've heard stories about uh, statues being sto stolen, animals being stolen, that type of thing. The statue is the incident that I'm talking okay. about. And there's some differences of opinion uh, that I'll not go into. All right. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the bull over in the animal science was or disappeared. Mm -hmm. And uh, a very good friend of mine, whom I will not name, uh, <laughs> was <laughs> president of the Ag Council. He was also president of the Agronomy Club. My brother was vice president of the Agronomy Club. I was secretary of the Agronomy Club. And that the, those three got a, an invitation, I will say, to see Dr. Wilhelm. And Dr. Wilhelm was sitting at his desk and he said, we were the three of us on that side, he said, uh, I have been told that the Agronomy Club was responsible for the theft of the bow. And my friend, the president of the Agronomy Club, said, Dr. Wilhelm, that's the most absurd thing I've heard. And he leaned across the desk and it seemed like his finger was that long. And he said, that's what I told him. You're not the type of individual that would do such a thing. And we were. <laughs> and you were. <laughs> and from that day on, 
<laughs> I knew that Dr. Wilhelm knew because the head of the animal science department at that time was a very close friend of mine. I grew up with him just across the section. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed in their home many a night. And his brother was my close buddy. <laughs> and he, he drove to my residence. And he said, I want to know what you guys did with that bull. I was just going to ask you <laughs> that. <laughs> and I, I said, Glenn, we didn't have anything to <laughs> That bow, but we did. <laughs> and that was my first contact, real contact <laughs> with Dr. Wilhelm. Later in Ethiopia, I took him on extensive tours, just he and I alone, and uh, the opportunity to confess came up more than once, but I never did. But it was, I knew that he knew. So. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Whatever happened to that ball? Well, they found it. I don't know exactly when. I know where. Yeah. And it doesn't square with the story that was told in the Osteed magazine. So, again, we'll leave it there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> because there are plenty of people still living that. <laughs> A lot of them are gone that participated in that. Why was there such a rivalry between the engineers and the accidents? Oh, uh, I don't know why that would develop, but it did. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the theft of the bull arose uh, because the two divisions, ag and engineers, got together and arbitrarily agreed there would be no more of that. Mm -hmm. well, we decided there would be. <laughs> did they ever <laughs> did they ever get payback? Or no? No. Because you guys kept silent of who did it? Well we kept silent of who yeah. did it, of course. But they knew that it was the ags that did it. <laughs> because we also covered the pyramid with cow manure. I knew that story. I've yeah. heard that story. We also ran a flag. My brother painted a, a Hereford bull on a bed sheet, on a white bed sheet. Mm -hmm. oh, a nice piece of art. And we ran it up the engineer's flagpole and wired it in place and greased the pole. Oh, so they couldn't get it down. So they couldn't get it down. <laughs> But they did. Now, what kind of pranks did they pull on you guys? Well, they really didn't. Really? <laughs> no, no, no. No, it, it uh, for some reason, by doing that, we thought that they would, but they didn't. Hmm. I guess they were more cultured than we were. Wow, you guys had your fun of them, that's for sure. Oh, well, we did. Now, getting. Wow, what a nice transgression, bud. <laughs> now, did you, uh, what was your relationship with uh, President Com? Did you beat him, know him? Oh, he's a close friend of mine. Close friend? Yes, close friend, very close. I met him first, I guess, when he visited in uh, Ethiopia. And from that time on, uh, we had coffee and meals. Bob Com was a great person, and his wife also. Now, how did uh, how did he work? How did he view the Office of International Programs? I really don't know, uh, Jacob. Uh, he was, he was always supportive of the work that we were doing, and he was a pleasure to work with. He didn't always agree mm -hmm. uh, with 
what we wanted to do, but we always found common ground. Uh, it, it was an amicable relationship, very definitely. Uh, what about President Boger? At that time, it I'm was... Just, sorry, I'm just going through the presidents that you worked with. So. There, there was a transition attitude taking place at OSU. Uh, they were, for some reason, I say they, I couldn't name people or anything like that, but it was a... It, it, it was a felt movement away from international programs. International programs had, in, in many people's minds, too much power because we answered directly to the president. We handled all of the contracting. Uh, and there were re reasons that people uh, were concerned because uh, we didn't. We were not a budgeted entity. We developed our own income, and uh, I'd be the first to say many of those contracts were lucrative contracts due to overhead and so forth. And we did. We had a lot of money. There was resentment for us having that money because. Uh, uh, we could spend it as we determined. Mm -hmm. uh, we could write checks, things like that, which the other people of OSU could not do. Uh, we didn't have to go through the comptroller. Mm -hmm. We had our own bank account at uh, the bank downtown, Stillwater National Bank. I could uh, assist a student in paying their tuition. Mm -hmm. just by opening my desk drawer and writing a check right there that they could take to the bank mm -hmm. or that they could go to the bursar and pay their tuition. So the income came from these contracts? Yes. Primarily? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And, uh, but we, we provided, uh, as I said, a lot of services. Uh, we uh, handled the information about our OSU to the rest of the world. We published colored journals uh, in seven languages oh, wow. and uh, distributed those worldwide. So we provided uh, services to OSU and uh, we paid for a lot of travel of administrative personnel to projects and so forth uh, that uh, otherwise may not have they may not have been able to do mm -hmm. and this was for individual faculty also to attend conferences internationally and so forth Now, what about working with President Campbell? Did you work with him that much or no? <laughs> that was when it all came to an end. Mm. So our work with Dr. Campbell uh, was not too friendly an encounter. Although I got to know John fairly well. Uh, John was a, a good person. Mm -hmm. He wasn't operating unilaterally. He had others behind him that were insisting on change. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass. Okay. Uh, did you uh, ever work with Dr. Halligan or no? Not at all. Okay. Just trying to get that up to date. What were the benefits of working in the Office of International Programs? Like personnel or what did you well, feel? Well, uh, 
you you if you wanted to do something and you had the approval of Bill Abbott, the only other person you had to convince was the president. Uh -huh. And you had more freedom of action. You didn't have to go through all of the uh, rigmarole of regents and comptrollers and this, that, and the other. You could operate more freely. It's kind of nice to have a two-man bureaucracy then, right? Yeah, really. And I, I uh, personally think it was very effective. Did you uh, did you uh, travel extensively when you were in the office overseas or? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I did uh, when we had a project, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to take a junk, no. Like what? What were some of the projects that you recall that you worked with our on? Well, like I said, uh, when the Ethiopia project ended, uh, it seemed like that we withdrew or began a withdrawal from international projects. Mm -hmm. The scale of the international contact was reduced, uh, and most of my work was uh, related to supporting the colleges in programs that they chose mm -hmm. to participate in. Now, they always chose to participate in them when uh, the Office of International Programs was more active. but. Uh, the relationship changed, they became more involved in their own contracting and so forth you know, on their terms. Did you, how would you go about securing a contract? Like, could you describe that kind of process for me? Did Ord ordinarily, uh, it was uh, a contact from a sponsor, whether they be governmental or institutional or some other private even. Uh, then the, the other way was through the U.S. government. They would identify projects that they wanted to fund and then they would ask institutions to submit proposals. And uh, in the beginning, they were quite simple, but they became more and more and more complex and more competitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't seem to fare too well in the attaining of contracts. So they were like grant competitions in a way? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. How would a uh, did you put like feelers out to universities worldwide that hey come to OSU we offer oh, yes. these ser services? That, that that's what I was mentioning when we furnished information in seven languages. Those went to educational institutions worldwide. They went to U.S. embassies and consulates. They went to uh, ministries of education in those countries that uh, we printed that language in. And uh, that even included Arabic and Chinese. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we actively contacted okay. sources for students. And these were like basically snapshots of the university or like? Well, they were snapshots of the university, but they also described the uh, curriculum uh, and degree plans available in the various colleges of the mm -hmm. university. 
where were you most successful about bringing in students? Like, what countries stand out? Like, you brought in, like, the most Pakistanis, or where were you most well, successful uh, when you were there? Certain uh, South American countries, primarily Venezuela and Colombia, uh, somewhat uh, Bolivia, then uh, there was Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Jordan, India, mm -hmm. Pakistan, and even uh, even uh, China. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, a sizable group here from the Labor Department in China. Did you mention th Thailand? Mm -hmm. Did you help uh, bring about the Thai connection to OSU? Or? Oh yes, uh, the OSU had a development program similar to the Ethiopia program in Thailand, mm -hmm. yes. Could you describe your relationship with Bill Abbott? How did you guys work together? What was he like personally? That kind of information about him. Well, Bill, I always had a good relationship with Bill, and it, to me it's a very sad tale the way he ended his career at OSU. He exercised for many years a lot of power at OSU in the international sphere and is responsible to, to a great extent for OSU involvement internationally, just as Henry G. Bennett and Oliver Wilhelm were. And uh, Bill was always a fine fellow to me. In the end, I think our relationship suffered a bit because uh, they terminated his well career at OSU in a manner that I'm not in agreement with. But I hadn't I didn't have the power to influence it. And I think uh Bill might think that I didn't do enough to prevent it, but it was a change that probably needed to be made. Jacob, mm -hmm. uh, let's just leave it there. But our relationship was excellent. Mm -hmm. Like, what was his personality like? Was he jovial? Was he oh, yeah. easy going? Bill, Bill was jovial. Uh, he was easy going, but uh, he was, when it came down to business, he was a very astute businessman in the sense that things would accrue to the entity that he was representing. Mm -hmm. He was, he was shrewd. Was, I hate to use the term, always looking to make a buck. Is that the type oh, of yes. personality yes, he was? Yes, definitely, definitely. Because uh, we had to maintain our own way. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we were able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh? How did he get along with various presidents? Did he work well with them, or presidents? You say? Yeah, until uh, or unless until the very end, because was some, Henry G. excellent with uh, Oliver Wilhelm excellent uh, with uh, Bob Com excellent uh, with Larry Boger. And with uh, J. 
John Campbell, not at all. How did how did uh, Bill Abbott become involved with the office? Do you know that story or no? Well, at a very young age, I I don't know the name of the uh, program that he was involved with. But uh, it involved uh, going to Washington, and and as I said, Bill was a, a very shrewd negotiator, mm -hmm. and uh, he made his mark early, and participated in the Washington uh, oriented involvement of OSU not necessarily international programs, mm -hmm. they were state-oriented uh, programs. And that, uh, that was back under Henry G. Bennett. Mm -hmm. So that's about all I could, okay. could say. How was the organization run? How, how was it run structurally? Like, who made the decisions and... Well, the ultimate decision, of course, was Bill's. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was very receptive to uh, suggestions, ideas, plans, very definitely. And what was your office like? Like, how many people worked in the office besides you and Bill? Was there secretaries or, I'm just trying to get Yes, all, there, there were secretaries. I'm just trying to get an overall picture. There were secretaries and there were, uh, we had uh, accountants in our office that uh, did the accounting work. Um, there were student, uh, well, there were people who handled the student work mm -hmm. under me. And uh, there were, well, I had one, two, three, four people full time that worked with students. Oh, wow. Well, because all international students that were sponsored came through our office. Yes. So that was a sizable number. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I even uh, took care of their sponsorship monies, but it all passed through the accountant's office. Mm -hmm. But I had to keep, because I did the, re the, uh, the accounting to, uh, no, that's not the proper word, the reporting to the sponsor. Yes. In the expenditure of the funds, the academic progress of the student, and so forth, or whatever else they requested. Mm -hmm. Did the office work with uh, campus faculty? Mm -hmm. Like, how would they evolve, involve uh, campus faculty? Well, oftentimes, uh, a student would uh, be admitted to Oklahoma State University, a sponsored student, uh, to, to a graduate degree program, and I would work with the respective department that he was going to, he or she was going to study in to uh, identify a major advisor and then I would work with the student and the major advisor then in setting up their curriculum and, and their financial support for graduate program and things like that. Mm -hmm. About how many students would you have come through your, would be on campuses, I, let me rephrase that, 
how many students on average would you think the OSU would have during a given semester during your time here? Foreign students. You mean that came through our office? Yes, yeah, that came through your office. How many did you work with? Well, it varied uh, from uh, year to year, but uh, I was trying to think. We would have in the neighborhood of 400 sponsored, four to 500 sponsored students. How did the office uh, fit within the university's land grant mission? Mm, that's a hard one to, to answer. We fulfilled, well, I, I don't think we operated within the land grant system really, mm -hmm. because the land grant system was in in the beginning viewed as a an educational opportunity for the rural populace mm -hmm. and especially the lower income end of the population. Whereas the Office of International Programs operated entirely internationally. Mm -hmm. So if the land grant system had an international aspect to it, uh, <laughs> we participated in it. Well, would, would you consider it was part of the outreach component of the yes. triangle? Yes, yes. That's a good way to put it. Because definitely the international uh, aspect and effect would affect uh, the land grant people, mm -hmm. the populace uh, of a state uh, and nation. How do you think uh, having international students benefit the university? Well, of course, the first thing that anybody would notice would be the cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. And uh, underneath that would be uh, the uh, political differences because most international students are quite well informed of politics, more so than we are. And uh, that exchange does take place in informal meetings ordinarily. Friendships that are formed and uh, the exchange uh, is made at that level. How is it uh, beneficial for the student once they arrive? Besides the educational aspect, what do you think that the people of Oklahoma can offer a foreign student what kind of values and you know you you know what I'm trying to get at what can what can a student learn about oh take back that they learned about Oklahoma <laughs> uh, I'll put it this way I was taking a a graduate student he had completed a doctoral degree. I was taking him to the airport and uh, I asked him the question. I said, uh, what impressed you most about the United States and specifically Oklahoma? He said, this will sound funny to you, but what impressed me was that everybody can drive their own car directly to their house. <laughs> you don't think too much about that, but uh, in many countries of the world, you'd have to park your car 50 miles away and travel by some other means to get to your house. So uh, we gave to them a sense of development, rural development especially, 
that they didn't see in the way we would get products to market, mm -hmm. the way we would travel to visit one to the other. In other words, we were we gave to them a broader concept of community. Was there talking to students? Was there was there a sense of democratic values imparted on them too? Oh yes, very definitely. Uh, they they readily saw the differences in in our transition as I said, of power uh, from one administration to the other. Mm. Uh, they marveled at how that worked. And uh, they tried to understand how that worked. And that it could be done. And that it can be done, yes. That's good. How did the, how did the office evolve when you were in your position? Did it grow or did you add more? Or? Yes, it grew in uh, that uh, I was the primary mover in uh, getting information about OSU uh, to uh, into other languages and getting it uh, disseminated. As, as broadly as I could worldwide. So it evolved in, for one thing, an increased number, although as a percentage of the student body, it didn't change. Because student population expanded. That's right. But our numbers of students mm -hmm. increased. Now, what kind of programs were expanded under your leadership? I would say the student programs, sponsored programs, primarily because our developmental contracts diminished mm -hmm. and we concentrated on training programs of short duration, uh, graduate programs under sponsorship, those types of programs. What were some of the challenges that the office faced? Well, as I said, the uh, evolutionary changes that were taking place uh, in the desire to decentralize the international involvement of uh, OSU and that the respective departments and colleges would do their own international work. Now is that is that the model that is currently in place where the yes. colleges do their own work? That's right. Okay. And is that how the, if off, the office has evolved since you left to that structure? Well, it stayed that way at least. Mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what about some significant changes since you left? What have you noticed that uh, besides the name change to the School of International Studies? Well, the fact that uh, it is International Studies, uh, that's uh, a very so it's, added necessity. So it helps that your office didn't deal, now correct me if I'm wrong, but your office didn't deal with OSU students going overseas or didn't it? No, it did not. So now the School of International Studies deals with, with that the right. boys? And that, that uh, is something that has changed over time. When I, I was a part of the International Programs Office, 
the university did not encourage uh -huh. uh, OSU students being involved in overseas study. Uh, that has changed since I left the office. Uh -huh. Where do you think the program is currently headed? Do you think where the, do yeah, where do you think the School of International Studies like mission is headed? Do you think that someday as a requirement I've heard this saying that one of the missions uh, currently is that every student every shall student have an is, international experience. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a noble dream. Uh, but I think Is they, it feasible? It's feasible that an increased, greatly increased number will have an international experience and should have, but 100%, uh, uh, I doubt that that uh, will take place. I certainly will not see it, mm -hmm. but uh, I'd say it's a goal to shoot for. And uh, I think the School of International Studies has played uh, an integral part in uh, creating that concept. I don't think that rests with the president alone. And uh, I think that's evidenced by the fact uh, that Dr. Holmes uh, did push and others, Larry Boger and uh, others, did push for interna a School of International Studies. Uh, the uh, establishment of a, what do they call it, uh, African studies group, uh, things like that. I think that uh, is an indication that we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything you would like to add about the uh, Office of International Programming programs? I should say. Well, I think it uh, was a a very effective tool in involving Oklahoma State University in international work. But it also uh, was a, an entity that was of, what would you say, uh, it would not last forever because it did not fit the administrative uh, process that OSU wanted to move in the direction of, and that was decentralization. Okay. Now, one last question before we end this. How, how do you feel about o Oklahoma State University generally? What do, where does it hold in your life? Can you describe that feeling for us? <laughs> yes. Uh, I guess I could say it's been my life in the greater aspect. Now, there are some things I do not agree with in the development of Oklahoma State University, and that is sports coming ahead of academics. I cannot see that. And uh, as one of our coaches, noted coaches, made the statement that athletics is the front door to the university. I cannot agree with that. I cannot agree with that. So I would like to see more emphasis placed on academics than is placed on sports. Mm -hmm. That bothers me. Mm -hmm. Although I enjoy sports <laughs> tremendously, <laughs> tremendously. But uh, the emphasis that is placed on that uh, is overgrown. How do you feel about uh, Mr. Pickens and his recent contributions to the university? In academics? Or mm -hmm. Academic. I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. I applaud him for it. Can you give more? That's right. <laughs> Empty out that bank account. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there like any Thing you would like to add that we haven't covered in the last three hours here? 
Well, back to OSU, I think it's a great institution. I would like to see it uh, even more heavily involved in international uh, enterprises. And one of the things I think is in student exchanges and faculty exchanges. And on a one-to-one -one basis, I think uh, there's great room for progress there and um, a way to change world attitudes, uh, especially the way people think about the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, that bothers me because when I went overseas, uh, they almost worshipped Americans. It's not that way today, and uh, I don't think it needs to be that way. So I'd like to see greater faculty and student exchange programs implemented. And how would you like to be remembered? As somebody that helped people who needed help. Well, I thank you for this, uh, your participation in this interview today, and I wish you the best of luck, and once again, thank you.